Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it is time for another episode of the Grim Leftovers program right here on reallibertymedia.com. Now, opposed to what the uh, channel thing may tell you, it's episode 38, not episode 37. I forgot to change that. Anyway, it is Monday, September 9, 2019, and you're here live on reallibertymedia.com or rlmradio.xyz, maybe on freedomsnetwork.com, reallibertyorg tune in, internet radio, a number of places you may be on this evening. Now, first things first here, before we start and get into the show, I have a brief thing that I wrote here, and I want to share it with y'all. It'll be put into the post-show blog so you can read it there uh, if you'd like to after this. Yesterday, September 8th, 2019, sadly, a valued and admired member of the Real Liberty Media RLM family passed away. Mr. Don Carroll, or as some of you may have known him, I.B. Don C. His presence will be missed here at RLM. We wish his family, friends, and loved ones our greatest condolences and all the best wishes. I personally knew Don as an extremely nice guy. He was very smart and caring. He often spoke about his family and his pets. He never had a harsh word for anyone. He was great with computers and would offer advice when wanted, where needed. He liked being a bit of a practical joker, as was evidenced by his trying to catch people off guard with fake ducks in the duck hunting game. He enjoyed music. I know of two artists he especially liked, Imelda May and Haley Reinhardt. We're sad to see you go, Don. You will be remembered. Few words from the Bahagda, Bahagvad Gita. All that lives, lives forever. Only the shell, the perishable, passes away, and the spirit is without end, eternal, deathless. Rest in peace, Don. <clears throat> All right. So, um, <laughs> let me say hi to the folks here in the chat. Yeah, it's a little... Yeah, I, 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 I don't... Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I feel something weird. The whole thing. And I, I, it was it was so unexpected uh, f for him to go. I mean, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, I I know of no health problems with him. But uh, he was a good guy. That's all. He was a good guy. Anyway, let me say hi and howdy to the folks here in the chat room this evening on RealLibertyMedia.com. Uh, oh, by the way, if anybody wants to call in and say anything um, on the wire, on wire.com, uh, feel free. I am at Grimnir on wire, so anybody that wants to call in, uh, just uh, go ahead and send me a, a connection request and I'll, I'll take your call. All right, so uh, in the chat room tonight, we have Barman and Beetle and Cowboy Tech, myself and the Moose Girl. We have Mr. Asmo, Chalcedoni and Echelon, Miss Graham Z. I.B. Don C. is still in here. He's, he's still in the chat. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I think Chloe said yesterday, it's kind of comforting to still see him around. So, hey, Don, how you doing, man? All right, we got Java Doctor and Meister Brow in the Ponder Dunder. Mr. Poopster and Prince, who will be doing their show Thursday evening. We got Miss Kate and Rob Works pass around that bubbler. We got Rome's and Vanna White, Mr. Vin E, the Weather Dork Bot, and Mr. Woodman, who is uh, uh, kind of like Meister Brow, only different. We have Phantom and CC66, Joe Scura, Circle Cyborg Noodle, Damn Van Meter! Uh, <laughs> we have N Siv and Frumpy2 and Grommet and Juzus and uh, JJ's. We have Kiss and Matt WJ, 2002. Mr. Snick hanging out with us. The Pone Sauce, the real Donnie Wu. The Sock Puppet himself. And Smartass and the Holiest Roger. 
So welcome to all the folks that are here in the chat and those of you that are listening but not in the chat. And like I said, feel free. Come on over to the chat. We, we, we always uh, uh, got to like having you around here in the chat talking around with us. Anyway, those uh, words, those f last words I read were from something called the Bahag uh, Bahagva Gita. It's hard to say. It's a hard word to say. Uh, anyway, that's it's an old, old, it was ancient text written about 5,100 years ago or so, a Hindu uh, document. And uh, I don't really have too much to say about it. It's it's got a lot of philosophy and interesting information. And did I not did I not bring it up here? Well, let me let me bring up the link here for you because uh, I want to share that link with you guys in case you want to read more. There's a there's a ton of stuff uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. That particular verse was kind of a paraphrased verse uh, from uh, section two, chapter eighteen. Or chapter two, section eighteen. I, I don't know how you exactly go about that, but uh, uh, so if you want to check out that, there's a lot of stuff you may find interesting in there. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, yeah, <laughs> all right. Oh man, it's a, it's a tough one uh, when 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 uh, one of our friends goes away. Yeah. All right. Enough of that. Enough of that. On to the on to the, on to the stories here. On to the news. On to the old news. On to the old stuff that's not really news at this point. It's it's spelt like that right there, Chuskira, to that link there. B h a g a v a d dash g i t a. Yeah. Check it out. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so this article was obviously written before Dorian came into being, but it doesn't matter. I think it still, I think it still holds true, even though we have had Dorian. Uh, and this is posted on What's Up With That dot com on August seventh, two thousand nineteen. Here, slowest start to Atlantic hurricane season since two thousand four. That's fifteen years. Watching the current maps and models, it appears the 2019 Atlantic hurricane season is off to a slow start. For people that depend on the disaster porn, climate alarmists in the media and the like, that means no weather events to claim as being climate driven. Now, as you all probably know, now, since Dorian did come into effect, oh, they're all over it, claiming that was... Uh, climate change, global warming driven. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, with no current areas of storm development, 2019 has had the slowest start since at least 2004 when Hurricane Charlie was named on August 9th, 2004. In a private email with top-notch hurricane forecaster Joe Bastardi, he concurs with that assessment and adds, there is a chance that this could tie 1977 for the lowest August Atlantic uh, hurricane season, uh, accumulated cyclone energy, uh, an index used to measure the tropical storm hurricane energy released into the atmosphere. 1977 had the lowest season for ACE. Uh, a National Hurricane Center says nothing is likely ahead for the next five days. Of course, we're well beyond those five days, so, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, the uh, there's they have a map here showing the Atlantic with no new tropical cyclones are expected during those next five days. Assuming no new tropical cyclones form by August 9th, and, uh, yeah, Dorian was after that, the, the slow start of named storms would then go back to 2001, when Tropical Storm Chantal was named on the 14th of August. Uh, the peak of the season lies ahead in September, of course, so uh, we can probably, most likely, expect more hurricanes coming up this during this month here. So, uh, anyway, that's something interesting, you know, uh, for you hurricane and watchers, such things like that out there, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, Kate points out Charlie made landfall landfall Friday the thirteenth. 
I don't think we have any lined up uh, hurricanes for this Friday the 13th coming up on September 13th. So, uh, but that that was a uh, Friday the 13th of August of 2004. All right, more on the global warming insanity <laughs> from the from the no trick zone here, uh, posted on uh, the 31st of May this year uh, by P. Gosselin. 10 of 10 coastal Antarctic stations show zero warming over past decades. Failed scientists need to resign. And there was an update here. Uh, Another coastal station has been added, uh, so it's now 11 stations. Over the past few years, climate alarmists have increasingly been resorting to weather ambulance chasing which has necessitated the trotting of the globe in search of weather anomalies to behold as proof of man-made climate change. But one place they have been avoiding, like the plague, is Antarctica, as a number of studies have been showing the opposite of what's pre- what was predicted earlier and uh, has been happening down there at the South Pole, except for a volcanic activity beneath parts of the Antarctic ice shelf. Uh, Analysis of the Antarctic stations show cooling. Cooling. Today, we look at 10 Antarctic stations under operation in Antarctica, uh, scattered along the Antarctic coastline and operated by various countries. These are not impacted by volcanic activity. So you got the Neumeyer, no, uh, there's a whole bunch of them listed there. You'll have to read through them. Um, with the 2018 data now in, is a good time to look at the long-term temperature trends of these stations. We do know that the Antarctic sea ice extent has seen an impressive upward trend over the last 40 years and tells us cooling may be at play. And so they have a graph here showing the southern hemisphere sea ice extent uh, with uh, quite the, quite the nice little increase from uh, 1980 through 2017. What follows are annual mean temperature charts of each of the 10 Antarctic stations unimpacted by volcanic activity. Both show, uh, Buller Island and Neumeyer, both show a clear downward trend so you, you can look, it's kind of clear, not really all that clear, but uh, it, it's kind of mixed up in the midst of the data. Uh, but you can, you can see it if you, if you look at it properly. The Halley, H-A-L-L-E-Y uh, station, uh, also shows a downward trend since 1956. Uh, Sayawa and Casey, data in from Japan, uh, operated Sayawa station, and the Australian Casey stations both show no trend since 1961. Here we see no signs of any warming. Basically done, zero. Uh, maybe, maybe a little cooling, if anything. Davis. The Davis station goes back 35 years and show a flat trend. Very slight cooling, in fact. No warming has been detected there since the Great Global Warming Scare in the 1980s. So far, six of the six stations plotted show no warming over the last several decades. The Zhongshan. This Antarctic station shows a definite cooling trend over the past 30 years. And it does uh, from uh, minus like 9.7 degrees to about uh, 10 and a half degrees down. So uh, there's that one. The Myrno. Station has been recording temperature data since 1967, more than half a century. It too, it too is statistically flat, even showing a very slight cooling trend. Uh, the Dumont and uh, Dumont Dervy and Mausen Antarctic stations have recorded data going back to the 1950s. As the following chart tells us, there have been no warming at all. Uh, long in these two long-term stations, the Novolozarsk 
<laughs> I don't know how to say these words. This station has not seen any warming in 40 years. Instead, the trend has been cooling. And there is a, not just the uh, up and down line, but also a, a trend line out there. So none, not, not a single one show warming. Not a single Antarctic coastal station shows warming, with most showing cooling. Now you know why the climate change ambulance chasers have been silent about this remote, vastly undisturbed content. Then they go to the uh, South Shetland Islands, uh, and we look at the annual temperature of five stations in South Shetland and the Antarctic o Oceans there, all showing uh, uh, some cooling as well. Uh, the seas, the Antarctic seas are showing cooling as well. So all you uh, global warming wackos out there, <laughs> too bad, so sad for you. Your lies have been exposed yet again, yet again. Uh, just your, I, I can't check your links in the middle of a show. Sorry, Ben. Um, <laughs> if you, if you want to PM that to me, I'll take a look at it later on. But, uh, yeah, I can't do it during a show. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and again, the, the no trick zone um, and, and what's up with that? Neither of those are oil industry <laughs> people. So uh, whatever. <laughs> if you really believe in, in human caused global warming, human caused climate change, you're listening to too much propaganda. So um, yeah, yeah. And you're not you're not checking on things like climate gate. If you don't remember all the all the fake uh, emails, all the fake data, the emails about the fake data, I should say, man, uh, Michael man made hockey stick stuff. <laughs> they faked all the data. They manipulated the data. They removed the old warming periods. Uh, they 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 changed the actual data from what it should be to make it fit what they wanted it to be. So that they could say, look, our data shows this. Yeah, but your data's made up. It's phony. It's phony. So um, if you have real data, yeah, if you actually had real actual data that made a solid case and that, that, that you could say this is caused by humans in some way or another rather than that big ball of fire in the sky that makes you nice and toasty warm. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to listen to any information about this. Uh, I've been I've been studying this since the early 2000s uh, when, when they started yammering on about it. <laughs> All right, he, you believe warming is happening, uh, but do you think it's human caused? Which is, uh, which, is, which is the key factor here, the key little factoid of the way that they want to be able to control you is by saying, this is human caused. You are destroying the planet. You, personally, you, by living, by breathing, by eating, by just existing, you are, you are personally responsible. Feel bad about it. Now give us all your money. Oh, we're going to take all your money. You don't have to give it to us. We'll just take it because that's how we're going to control you is, is, is via climate guilt. <laughs> uh, so anyway, anyway, <laughs> next article here. Uh, and, and this, you know, I, I don't really know what to make about it. Um, But but you could you could take it for what it's worth here. It's posted on fizzorg fizz .org here on August seventh. Earth's last magnetic field reversal took far longer than once thought. If it took longer than a day, it took longer than I thought. I thought it was a like a catastrophic thing that it just happened. Boom, and and the Earth's magnetic field reversed. They say not so much. 
Earth's magnetic field seems steady and true, reliable enough to navigate by. Yet largely hidden from daily life, the field drifts, waxes, and wanes. I can buy all that. The magnetic pole, uh, magnetic north pole, is currently careening towards Siberia, which recently forced global positioning system that underlies modern navigation to update its software sooner than expected for the shift. And very, or every several hundred thousand years or so, the magnetic field dramatically shifts and reverses its polarity. Magnetic north shifts to the geographic south pole and eventually back again. This reversal has happened countless times over the Earth's history, but scientists have only a limited understanding of why the field reverses and how it happens. Of course, it happens on all the other planets and the sun as well, um, and it happens on the sun fairly often, actually, uh, far, more, far, far more frequent than it happens on Earth. Uh, but, but all of the planets, their magnetic field does reverse. Uh, n new work from the University of Wisconsin-Madison geologist Brad Sigger and his colleagues find that the most recent field reversal some 770,000 years ago took at least 22,000 years to complete. That's a long time. That's several times longer than, than previously thought, and the results further call into question controversial findings that some reversals could occur within a human lifetime. As I said, I thought it happened within a day. I thought it was like, boom, it get to a certain tipping point and then just shifts over, which if you've ever played with any magnets um, and, and kind of try to line up the, 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 the various poles, you watch them bounce around real fast. So I, I thought it kind of happened like that. They're saying that a human lifetime is fast, but that 22,000 years, that's a long ass time for a reversal to happen. The new analysis, based on advances in measurement capabilities and a global survey of lava flows, ocean sediments, and Antarctic ice cores, provides a detailed look at turbulent time for Earth's magnetic field. Over millennia, the field weakened partially shifted, stabilized again, and then finally reversed for uh, for good, well, not really for good, but for now, to the orientation we have today. Uh, the results provide a clearer, more nuanced picture of reversals at a time when some scientists believe we may be experiencing the early stages of reversal as the field weakens and moves. Other researchers dispute the notion of a present-day reversal, which would likely affect our heavily electronic world in unusual ways. So Sanger published his work on August 7th in the journal Science Advances. He collaborated with researchers at Kumamoto University in Japan and University of California, Santa Cruz. Reversals are generated in the deepest parts of the Earth's interior, but the effects manifest themselves all the way through the Earth, and especially at the surface, and in the atmosphere. Unless you have a complete, accurate, and high-resolution record of what a field reversal really is like at the surface, uh, then it's difficult to even discuss what the mechanics of generating a reversal are. So, uh, this is all um, theory. It's all theory. They don't know for sure. Now, I, I checked a bunch of data. Uh, I, I checked a bunch of data back early 90s, I guess. I, I think it was in the early 90s. I was taking a, a, a geology course at one of the local colleges down there in, in San Diego. Um, and and for my, my final paper, we had to write a final paper. It's not like a thesis or anything, just a, a final paper. I did it. On, on the magnetic pole reversal. And I studied all kinds of stuff. And it looked to me as if the, the change was very fast. Maybe not a day, but certainly not, not 100 years, or far less than 100 years. But they're saying uh, maybe as few as, as a human lifetime or as much as 22,000 years. 
and from the information I saw, the uh, data in in the in the rocks, uh, it it appeared to happen almost immediately. So I don't I don't know uh, what's what's true and not. And you know what? Neither do they. They probably have more information than I had from the few books that I was able to. Uh, uh, get from from the university uh, library there, but uh, and, and that was this was pre-internet, by the way. We didn't have internet back then. <laughs> so 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 all of my all of my all of my uh, research was done in books. <laughs> so uh, there, there's probably a whole lot more information available out there now um, uh, than than I ever could have possibly got to. Uh, especially with with university books, you know, uh, they they had they had limited uh, resources, and probably not a whole lot of interest in that field of study. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, um, if what they say is true, we're probably fine. Is at least within our lifetime, uh, with as far as a magnetic pole reversal goes. <laughs> All right, uh, going on to a, a totally different uh, poll reversal. This posted on davidike.com um, is an article, a very interesting article. I am a Syrian living in Syria. And this is more, it's, it seems more relevant now because they're, they're striking up a lot of the new tensions in Syria once again, for whatever reason. Uh, well, I don't think they ever really stopped with the tensions in Syria. It kind of got pushed back uh, from from the front page articles for a while, but but they're bringing it up again and they're doing nasty stuff in Syria again. They're doing drone attacks and all kinds of crap like that over there again. So this article on davidike.com. I'm a Syrian living in Syria. It was never a revolution, nor a civil war. The terrorists are sent by your government. Two years ago, Majd, M-A-J-D, wrote these words on a Facebook posting. I'm a Syrian living in Syria in the middle of everything. We have seen horrors. It was never a revolution, nor a civil war. The terrorists are sent by your government. They are Al-Qaeda, Jabat, Al-Nusra, Wahhabi Salafists, Talibans, etc. And the extremist jihadists sent by the West. The Saudis, Qatar, and Turkey. Your Obama and whoever is behind him or above him are supporting Al-Qaeda and leading the proxy war on my country. We thought you were against Al-Qaeda and now you support them. The majority here loves Assad. He has never committed a crime against his own people. The chemical attack was staged by the terrorists, helped by the USA and the UK, etc. Everyone knows that here. American soldiers and people should not be supporting barbarian Al-Qaeda terrorists who are killing Christians, Muslims in my country, and everyone. Every massacre massacre is committed by them. We were all happy in Syria. We had free school and university education available for everyone. Free health care, no GMO, no fluoride, no chemtrails, no Rothschild's IMF controlled bank, state owned central bank, which gives 11% interest. We are self-sufficient. We have no foreign debt to any country or bank. Like before, the crisis was so beautiful here. Now it's hard and horrific in some regions. I do not understand how the good and brave American people can accept to bomb my country, which has never harmed them and therefore helped the barbarian Al-Qaeda. These animals slit throats and behead for pleasure. They behead babies and rape young kids. They are sat satanic. Our military, helped by the millions of civilian militias, are winning the battle against Al-Qaeda. But now the USA wants to bomb the shit out of us so that Al-Qaeda could get the upper hand. Please help us, American people. They are destroying the cradle of civilization. 
Stop your government. Impeach that bankster puppet you have as president. Support Ron Paul or Rand or anyone uh, the, the like anyone of the like who are true American patriots. But be sure of one thing. If they attack, and I think they will, it will be hell. Be sure that if we were uh, to be a world war, many will die. Syria can and will defend itself and will sink many U.S. ships. Iran will go to war. Russia and China eventually if it escalates. And all this for what? For the elites who created Al-Qaeda through the U.S. government and use, use it to conduct proxy wars and destabilize countries which do not go along with their new world order agenda. American people, you gotta regain control of your once admirable country. Now everyone hates you for the death you bring almost everywhere. Ask the Iraqis, the Afghans, the Pakistanis, the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Macedonians, the Serbs, the Libyans, the Somalis, the Yemenis, all the ones you, your government, kill with drones every day. Stop your wars. Enough wars. Use diplomacy, dialogue, help, not force. From a Syrian living in Syria that has lived through all of this. This is not going to be published via your CNNs or MSNBCs, ABCs, New York Times, Washington Posts. They will never pu publish that. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, uh, yeah. I feel really bad for them, the people that live there, and for that country. Chaskur says he's extremely suspicious of any Syrian saying that life was beautiful before in Syria. All you got to do is look at the photographs from before the civil war, quote unquote, began, and you can see what it was. It was a beautiful modern country that, that rivaled life in the U.S. They had supermarkets all over the place. They had good good roads and hospitals and they had everything that you you are used to having here it, it was not this hellhole third world looking country uh, that that you're looking at now it was not afghanistan by any stretch of the imagination and afghanistan i mean if they hadn't been being attacked for the last forever uh, they probably would have come forward a little bit too i don't know uh, under some of their their religious beliefs over there, but Syria was was they had a huge Christian population there as well. So anyway, enough on that. I say enough on that. Um. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Chloe points out that geology classes are. Uh, very good, very important, especially for things like architecture. So, I absolutely you need to know you need to know about the ground. Ground you need to know what, what you know, um, and, and not just for for architecture, but for all kinds of various things. But uh, especially, I mean, if you're planning on living somewhere, you, you gotta want to know. <laughs> oh man, bread! That old band that sang all those. Sappy songs? All right. Okay. Um, all right. Next. Uh, from ZDNet.com, posted August 6th here uh, under the security heading. AT&T employees took bribes to plant malware on the company's network. The Department of Justice charges Pakistani man with bribing AT&T employees more than $1 million to install malware on the company's network and unlock more than 2 million devices. Yeah. AT&T employees took bribes to unlock millions of smartphones and install malware and unauthorized hardware on the company's network. 
the Department of Justice said yesterday. These details come from a DOJ case opened against Mohammed Fad, a 34-year-old man from Pakistan, and his co-conspirator, some name I can't pronounce, believed to be deceased. The DOJ charged the two with paying more than $1 million in bribes to several AT&T employees at the company's Mobility Customer Care Center in Bosell, Washington. Operating since 2012, the bribery scheme lasted from at least April 2012 until September 2017. But you didn't hear about it till now. <laughs> Initially, the two Pakistani men uh, bribed AT&T employees to unlock expensive iPhones so they could be used outside of AT&T's network. The two recruited AT&T employees by approaching them in private via telephone or Facebook messages. Employees who agreed received lists of the IMEI phone codes, that's a little code inside of every cell phone, uh, which identifies your phone to you, uh, which they had to unlock for sums of money. Employees would then receive bribes in their bank accounts in shell companies they created or as cash from the two Pakistani men. The initial stage of the scheme lasted about a year until April 2013, when several employees left or were fired by AT&T. The malware stage. That's when FOD changed tactics and bribed AT&T employees to install malware on AT&T's network at the Bothell call center between April and October 2013. This initial malware collected data on how AT&T infrastructure worked. According to court documents unsealed yesterday, this malware appears to be a keylogger, having the ability to gather confidential and proprietary information regarding the structure and functioning of AT&T's internal protected computers and applications. As if AT&T wasn't screwed up enough on their own, <laughs> the DOJ said FOD and his co-conspirator then created a second malware strain that leveraged the information acquired through the first. The second malware used AT&T employee credentials to perform automated actions on AT&T's internal application to unlock phones at FOD's behest without needing to interact with AT&T employees every time. In November 2014, as FOD began having problems controlling the malware, it got out there in the wild. The DOJ said he also bribed AT&T employees to install rogue wireless access points inside the Bothell call center. Uh, these devices helped FOD with gaining access to AT&T internal apps and network and continue the rogue phone unlocking scheme. One AT&T employee made more than $428,500. The DOJ claims Fod and Jawani paid more than a million dollars in bribes to the AT&T employees and successfully unlocked more than two million devices, most of which were expensive iPhones. Anyway, the thing to the thing to, to take into account here is don't trust any of them. Don't trust a single one of them. Uh, the, if they're not just incompetent, they're rotten to the core. Now, today I got a letter in the mail, in the physical USPS mail, from the company, um, uh, what the hell is it called again? Um, a Cafe Press, who I have an account with. Um, telling me that my information had been hacked. They actually sent it in the mail, in the regular mail. So, so this was not like a free thing that they sent out, like an email, like a lot of them do, telling me you've been hacked. No, they sent out a real thing, a real letter, uh, saying I, uh, that, that my information was part of a huge hack attack against their company. Now, I, I knew about this a while back, because I already went, because when I went into a, uh, Use it. They said, "Oh, we've been hacked. Change your, change your password." Uh, but I, I'm safe, pretty much safe on it, because they never had my banking information. They never had my uh, social security number. 
uh, I, I had set up through them to be paid via PayPal. So I, I had that level of security there. But if you have uh, an account with Cafe Press in this instance, or, but thousands of other companies, they're, they're, your information's out there uh, in the hands of people that wish you no good. So um, just be beware, be wary, be careful, change your passwords often. Um, and if, if they do, if somebody does break in and get the, the company's whole database, there's not much you can do about it. If they get all of your, uh, like your social security and banking information, you're pretty well screwed at that point. Because as I said here with this AT&T thing, this happened years ago and you're just finding out about it now. Uh, and, and then that's the way it goes with so many of these hacks and attacks is, is that it's a couple years down the line, three years, five years down the line before you find out about it. And by that time, the damage is already done. So I, I don't know what you could do too much about something like that if you have uh, electronic accounts with, with companies that you need to do business with. Uh, but but they're, they're not careful. And uh, yeah, it's a huge problem. <laughs> all right all right we're going back a little bit here um uh, but but i think it's relevant at this point being as uh during the month of august your congressional rats were uh off on vacation so they weren't doing anything but they're back now they're back now and they're coming for your guns they want your guns and they want to say that you're nuts for wanting a gun. So since you're nuts, you're not allowed to have a gun, according to them. Although the Constitution says nothing like that. The Bill of Rights doesn't say if you're nuts, you don't get a gun. They they just put that together, cobble it together, and they're saying uh, they want your guns. But why? Why are, what's giving them the power to do this at this point in time? Well, of course the Walmart shooting in El Paso, at which they pointed out a lot of the uh, uh, lunatic corporate lame-ass propaganda groups that call themselves the media, not the media, all propaganda, all corporate media, and cor by corporate, I'm, I'm talking about the global banking cartel. Uh, they're, they're, the, they're the real ones that are in control of everything. But they pointed out uh, during that that this um, guy, this Walmart shooter, posted his manifesto up there on the interwebs for all to read. And what a crazy guy he was. And he posted it on a site called 8chan. The owner of 8chan says the manifesto was not uploaded by the El Paso Walmart shooter. That's right. <laughs> the, the owner of anonymous message board, HN, Jim Watkins, has unequivocally stated that the manifesto, which was said to have been posted uh, by the El Paso Walmart shooter on his website, was not actually posted by the killer. Just moments before the deadly shooting in El Paso on Saturday, a sinister four-page-long manifesto was posted to 8chan by someone who claimed to be the shooter. However, Watkins, an Army veteran, asserted that the shooter actually posted on Instagram prior to attack, and whoever uploaded the manifesto to 8chan was not the person who committed the heinous attack. First of all, the El Paso's shooter posted on Instagram, not 8chan, Later, someone uploaded the manifesto. However, that manifesto was not uploaded by the Walmart shooter. Watkins asserted in his video statement, I don't know if he wrote it or not, but it was not uploaded by the murderer. That is clear. And law enforcement was made aware of this before most people even heard the horrific news. Watkins asserted that through his platform, uh, or though his platform, is known for being a bastion of free speech, 
They have never and will never protect illegal speech. On Sunday, a campaign went viral to get hosting companies to ditch 8chan over the manifesto turning up there. Cloudflare, a web security company, also announced they would be dropping 8chan. Watkins said that uh, the, the move to target his website's hosting is political. Uh, from the 8chan on Twitter, some of you might have read that the Cloudflare news already, they're dropping 8chan, blog.cloudflare.terminating. Uh, there, there might be some downtime, there was, and uh, while they found a solution. Anyway, so um, for what it's worth out there, whether or not this guy wrote it, which I do not believe he did, I do believe that was uh, planted up there by uh, whoever created. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Whoever created uh, the Walmart shooter. What do you mean, whoever created? Well, <laughs> from the website dcdirtylaundry.com posted by Kurt Nemo on August 7th, 2019. Follow the dots. Follow the damn dots. MK Ultra and the El Paso shooting. It takes about five minutes of research to connect Patrick Crucis to the CIA and its notorious MK Ultra mind control program. John Brian Crucis is Patrick's father. He is a counselor involved in uh, involved in infused being therapy. Infused being therapy in Dallas, Texas. He specializes in trauma and PTSD. Crucis webpage notes he worked for the Timberlawn Mental Health System in Dallas. Timberlawn closed down in early 2018. The psychiatric hospital was investigated for patients abu patient abuse, including rape. Timberlawn is owned by the Universal Health Services, a Fortune 500 corporation in the hospital management business. In 2016, BuzzFeed ran an expose showing that the corporation is responsible for a number of questionable practices at its nationwide facilities. In addition to accusations UHS defrauded Medicare, the report lists a number of other serious violations, including holding patients solely for financial gain, not because they were ill, but just because they wanted that money. The FBI and DOD teamed up to investigate billings to TRICARE, and the, the insurance plan for the active military and their families. Where did I lose my spot out there? <laughs> I hate when I do that. Um, yeah, sometimes I, there we go. Uh, concerned by the use of psychotropic drugs on military personnel and veterans, Citizens Commission on Human Rights International Complaints noted that UHS developed a Patriot Support Program providing treatment for active duty members in the armed forces, veterans, and their families are also treated in the UHS behavioral f facilities. Researchers at Yale School of Medicine reported in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry that 30% of veterans prescribed psychotropic drugs had not been diagnosed with mental health problems. The military psychiatrists and physicians continue to hand out psychotropic medications like candy to active duty soldiers and veterans with or without a diagnosis of mental health problems. The drug companies continue to ignore off-label use of their drugs and are are glad the military cooperates in promoting them. Neither group confronts the clear evidence linking increased psychotropic drug use in the military with the increase in suicide and violent murders committed by our soldiers. On April 30th, 2007, the Massachusetts Daily Collegian announced the University of Massachusetts uh, hosted a lecture by Colin Ross, 
the founder and president of Colin Ross Institute for Psychological Trauma. Ross is well known for treating patients with multiple personality disorder and associated trauma disorders, including depression, self-mutilation, and suicide at Timberlawn. Back to their mental health system. Uh, during an interview with the Higher Side Chat podcast, a Canadian academic psychiatrist talked about taking up residency in Texas. That became the gateway to his involvement in the study of satanic cults. The first-hand accounts from patients detailing the victimization through military intelligence pro testing programs. Ross began investigating Project Bluebird, Project Artichoke, MK Search and Project MK Often. <laughs> MK All the Time. Uh, Ross describes his previous interactions with Sidney Gottlieb, notoriously accredited with spearheading CIA's effort to control the human mind. Gottlieb took part in numerous military intelligence experiments from using LSD on unsuspecting Americans to leading the charge on MK Ultra. In 1960, Gottlieb worked with Eisenhower administration on a plot to overthrow and discredit Castro, Fidel Castro. The CIA, under Richard Bissell, asked Gottlieb to come up with a plan to make Castro unpopular with the Cuban people. Plans included a scheme to spray a television studio in which, in which he was about to appear with the hallucinogenic drug LSD and contaminating his shoes with sallium, which they believe would cause his hair and his beard to fall out, which apparently in Cuba is a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, friends and enemies alike say Mr. Gottlieb was kind of a genius, striving to explore the frontiers of the human mind for his country while searching for religious and spiritual meaning in his life. But he will always be remembered as the government chemist who dosed Americans with psychedelics in the name of national security. The man who brought LSD to the CIA... <laughs> anyway, let's get down to the summary here. The father of the accused El Paso shooter, John Bryant Crucis, worked with Colin Ross at the Timberlawn Mental Health System in Dallas. Ross is said to have shared a relationship with Sidney Gottlieb, the father of trauma-based CIA MKUltra LSD mind control experiments, including brainwashing Manchurian candidates for assassination operations. Patrick Crucis is three degrees removed from the CIA and its mind control program. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. FDR supposedly said, In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. And despite a problem attributing this quote to Roosevelt, it is absolutely true. Mass shootings are highly political. I don't believe El pa the El Paso shooting on the heels of the FBI declaring white supremacy a top domestic terror threat, along with the conspiracy theories. That's right, if you believe in conspiracy theories, you're a domestic terror threat, according to the FBI. So he doesn't believe that this is a coincidence. I don't believe it's a coincidence either. Most of these shootings are classic problem reaction, solution events, which we're seeing now. The solution part, their solution. They created the problem, they planned the reaction, pushed the reaction, and now they're providing the solution. The solution in the name of massive background checks and national red flag theft of your guns. The solution being restrictive firearm laws contrary to the principles of the Second Amendment and the evolution of new enemies considered a threat to the state. So if you disagree with, question in any way, 
the state and its actions, you are a threat and you must be disarmed. All right. Finally. <laughs> Lastly, but not leastly. And I laugh. I laugh at this story. Just because cops are so stupid. But they did bad things to a guy over nothing. And it's, so it's not funny. But I still laugh at it because... Come on. Really? Are you really that stupid, you stupid pigs? Apparently they are. College athlete arrested after police mistake bird poop for cocaine. <laughs> August 10th, 2019, abc13.com, Savannah, Georgia. A drug charge has been dropped against a Georgia, Georgia Southern quarterback after a white substance he identified as bird poop on his car's hood tested negative for cocaine. A Saluda County Sheriff's Office police report said deputies pulled shy warts over for speeding July 31st and noticed the two white spots on his car they thought were cocaine. On the hood of his car. Somehow they thought he was doing cocaine on the hood of his car. They apparently have never seen bird poop on the hood of a car before. The report says Wurtz told them it was bird poop he had tried to wash off. The deputies then did a field test that came back positive for cocaine. Got that? They did a field test on bird poop, and the field test said, Oh, that's cocaine. And they're, they're using these field tests to do bad things to people. And they charged him with possessions, uh, possession of the drug. Wart's lawyer uh, told the Savannah Morning News, More sophisticated lab testing showed the substance was not cocaine, and they dropped the charges. Jones said the prosecutors told him the original speeding charge remains. Well, I think he needs to sue them. I don't know if he is suing them, has sued them, plans on suing them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think that's that's very lawsuit-worthy right there for you. Now, let me just say, anybody listening now that missed the beginning of the program here, the... Uh, Grim Leftovers, episode 38 here. Um, anybody listening that missed the beginning of the show, you missed my little um, tribute to Don. I be Don C., Don Carroll. So if you missed that, after I post up the podcast, please go back and listen. And uh, if you want to make comments on the blog post after that, that's great too. Um, We're all going to miss Don, I think. I think everybody here liked him. I don't know of anybody that didn't like Don. He was such a nice guy. Such a good guy. Uh, So, um, yes, he will be missed. Anyway, thank you all very much for tuning in this evening. I'll be back again next Monday with another episode of Grim Leftovers. Uh, We don't at this time have any Tuesday or Wednesday programming Uh, as uh, Flash and Grammy are both taking time off from the broadcasting realm. Uh, But I will be, uh, not I, (laughs) but uh, Poopster and Prince will be back on Thursday night with uh, their third edition, third or fourth is this going to be, I forget, of their show, The Power Hour. Um, Vinny will be on Friday at his normal time, 1 p.m. Eastern, as well as myself and The Mighty Moose Girl Friday night. At, at the Freakers Ball. So y'all have a great week. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon. Peace!